Yeah. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I now call this meeting to order at 7 p.m. June 7th, 2022. Um, for the audience here tonight, uh, the city of Glendora utilizes a hybrid meeting format to allow for, to allow for participation both in person and virtually. In consideration of others and the business conducted tonight, please silence your cell phones and any electronic device and refrain from speaking unless recognized. Let me do the same thing right here while I'm at it. All right. Um, this is a public meeting for the community of Glendora. We appreciate and respect your participation here this evening. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please uh, conduct roll? Thank you, Chair. At this time, I would like to conduct an oral roll call and request that each commissioner respond with present <laughs> when their name is called. Commissioner Becerra. Present. You wanna push the button to make sure that the people at home can hear you. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Norwood. Uh, present. Commissioner Ursetti. Present. Commissioner Ursetti, you're present? Yes. Thank you. Vice Chair Koss. Present. And Chair Davis. Thank you, all commissioners are present. present. <laughs> <laughs> all are present, thank you. Well-oiled machine here. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Commissioner Becerra if she would uh, lead us in a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All righty, thank you, Commissioner. Um, before we get into our, our agenda tonight, I just wanted to recognize um, the passing of a dear friend, uh, Mr. Doug Boyd. Um, he was a dear friend of mine and a political stalwart in uh, many areas of the political field. Um, it's quite shocking to me, and I've been struggling with it all day long. Um, he was a he was loved and loathed by many, and I'm not sure which role he relished the most, to be honest with you. Um, but he was a staunch advocate for any any cause that was in his uh, in his sights. So um, I just wanted to uh, mention Doug's passing tonight for those that knew him, um, and for those that didn't. Uh, you missed a character, I'm telling you. Anyway, rest in peace, Mr. Mr. Boyd, you'll be missed. All right, so with that, um, does anyone wish to reorder or add to the agenda tonight? Okay, seeing none, I will now open the uh, public comment period. I now invite members of the public to address the Planning Commission. Speakers are limited to three minutes speaking once, speaking once both on and off agenda items. All questions should be directed through the presiding officer. This is your time to speak uninterrupted. If you are in attendance, please fill out a speaker card and submit it to the recording admin before the close of the public comment period. Once recognized, speakers should advance to the podium or the lectern. State your name and subject matter to which you, you wish to discuss. If you are participating via Zoom, select the raise hand icon in Zoom before the close of the public comment period. Once recognized, you will receive a request to unmute State your name and the subject matter you wish to discuss. Okay, I would now like to invite anybody uh, either here in person or via Zoom for public comment. Thank you, Chair. I don't believe that we received any requests to give public comment at this time via the Zoom. Uh, if you'd like to use the raise hand icon, you can be acknowledged to give public comment at this point. Um, we have no one that has submitted anything via the email public comment email and no uh, public comment cards for this public comment period at this time. Okay, so nothing. So with that, I will uh, close the public comment period. Um, commissioner statements and reports. Um, I now invite each commissioner to provide a statement or report. Um, and I need to remember that uh, Commissioner Ursetti is uh, via Zoom. So we'll start with him. Commissioner Setti, do you have anything? Uh, nothing for me at this time. Thank you. 
Commissioner Becerra. Nothing from me at this time, thank you. Commissioner Norwood. Uh, nothing for me, thank you. And Vice Chair Koss. Nothing, thank you. All righty. Okay, at this time, I would like to invite Community Director Jeff Kugel to provide a statement. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Davis. Just a couple of things uh, first. Um, actually, I just received an email before this meeting um, that I wanted to share um, with the commission and whoever's watching that uh, with the um, with the orders regarding uh, water conservation in the state, the city has introduced a number of programs that are now available via the city's website, um, tools that the community can use to you know, implement um, water saving measures while we're in the middle of this drought. And so just wanted to let the commission know and invite the public to take advantage of that information, which is on the, on the city's website. And then secondly, I wanted to introduce a new employee with the city, Aaron Sines, who's a new planning tech um, in the planning division. And uh, Aaron will be working up the front counter, handling plan reviews and uh, new projects that come his way. So we're happy to have him on board and want to welcome him to the team. Um, and with that, that that's concludes my um, comments this evening. Uh, thank you, Director. Okay, uh, I'd like to invite uh, City Attorney Lana Lehman to provide any statements. She's attending via Zoom. I am attending via Zoom. I had a, uh, a, a, a just a, a conflict that prevented me from being there in person. I I preferred to be timely via Zoom as opposed to late via traffic. <laughs> That's okay, it. So I, I, I have no official statements. Okay, great. Okay. Um, also, I want to remind everybody there's still a little less than an hour to vote if you have not voted yet today. Okay, with that, that brings us to special items. I now call Senior Planner Hans Friedel to report on the beloved SB9. <clears throat> well, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Um, as requested, I'm here tonight to provide a quarterly update on SB9 activity here at the city. Um, just for some background for those maybe watching, um, and as a reminder, uh, SB9 went in effect this January um, 1st and enables residential lot splits and two dwellings per uh, eligible single family lot in single family zoning districts uh, without discretionary review or public hearings. Um, in anticipation, uh, next slide please. Thank you. Um, in anticipation of this law going into effect, um, staff worked with the planning commission uh, and the city attorney's office uh, last fall, really of late 21, to create a state compliant policy framework to process SB9 applications. Um, really, an idea being to sort of test the framework out, look before we leap, if you will, uh, prior to drafting an SB9 um, code amendment to the zoning code and probably subdivision standards too, or map standards. So uh, next slide, please. Um, our SB9 policy takes a pragmatic approach um, by allowing one full-size primary residence on a lot uh, and one secondary SB9 residence uh, subject to essentially the same standards for the secondary residence as a ADU under our current a ADU uh, code. Uh, and the framework um, kind of works with state law was the idea rather than against it while incorporating um, objective standards and attempting to protect neighborhood character um, the framework is available on our website as a handout. If you go to uh, City of Glendora's website, planning under applications and forms, that's where we have the handout. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we do need to track um, SB9 activity uh, for our sort of state rep for state reporting uh, requirements and to report back here. Um, so for our activity update, um, drum roll here. Um, year to date, we've had around 50 contacts via uh, phone calls, walk-ins at the counter, emails, uh, you know, inquiring about SB9. Um, you know, we have, some of those are folks that have repeatedly called about the same lot with a, like a follow-up question, et cetera. Um, total staff time spent since the first of the year has been around, we estimated about 25 hours. I have a log book. So we log our SB9 contacts and, you know, how they come in and what the lot is they're inquiring about and sort of the staff time spent basically in our estimation. Um, but interestingly, we have received no applications um, for SB9 lot splits or additional dwelling units. 
Um, and there's probably a lot there to kind of unpack, but I think some of the things that, you know, we're sort of hearing or I'm hearing, um, you know, as far as lot splits are concerned, if there's a lien on the property, you know, it's nobody really knows how to get, you know, I'd want one person that I spoke with anecdotally said they spoke with three different loan officers at three different banks. None of them had heard of SB9 and none of them were really going to be willing to give up half of the lot or some 40% of the lot portion under the terms of their mortgage. So they didn't really know how to process it either. So I think that's sort of a roadblock to lot splits. Um, why we haven't had second secondary units without lot splits, I don't, I don't really know. Um, next slide, please. So we've continued to make uh, minor revisions to the policy to sort of improve the graphics, clarity, explanations, that sort of stuff. And that's been based on you know, feedback again, areas that have been confusing with folks uh, in terms of some of really the pictures and graphics on the policy is where I've sort of fine tuned it. Um, again, the most current version is available online. Um, general feedback though has been positive about our policy framework, people we've provided it to and architects and such. Um, and it does seem generally understandable to people. Um, next slide, please. So we really have two questions tonight. Um, first one is, should we continue to make quarterly updates on SB9 activity? And the second one is, um, does the commission feel that we should proceed with an ordinance, uh, the beginning of drafting an ordinance to amend Glendora Municipal Code uh, to effectively codify the framework? <clears throat> Well, let me ask you this. Is that a decision you want us to make tonight or for us to vote on tonight or just give direction? I think direct. Yeah, just by consensus. consensus. I think it's not, this is just an informational item. So it's not, you're voting on just something, just consensus on us proceeding with an ordinance for SB9. Well, I, I personally, I think we should continue with the quarterly updates. I think SB9 is, uh, again, it, it, it's here to stay. I think sooner or later, um, things will start coming in. Maybe not. I may be wrong, but um, I, it's fairly painless for you to come up here and give us an update, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and as far as the code goes, ah, do we do we know if what we're doing is, I'm assuming it's working. It's, I mean, it, it, it it's, yeah. it, we haven't had any applications yeah. and people, the feedback we've received has been positive. We've also actually, you know, I, I hadn't mentioned this, but we've had a few other cities call and ask about our policy framework as well. Um, and seemed interested in it as well, the sort of the way we have some of the performance metrics and some of our objective standards. So, I mean, the sense that people seem to be interested in it, they're asking questions, they seem to appreciate the policy that we've created. Um, I would say in that sense, it's working, you know, it, it, it's hard to say until we receive an application. Um, and then we'll know what works and what does it with it at that point, I think. But Okay, let me be a little more formal and, and we'll go around the table here. And uh, Commissioner Norwood. So I have two questions. Uh, as far as the policy goes, uh, one, um, is there any, uh, during we were doing the, 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 the joint session with city council and planning commission going through that document regarding the... Um, uh, Rena, mm -hmm. uh, there was discussion of lawsuits possibly uh, concerning SB9 specifically. Are, are, uh, so I guess my question, uh, should we be thinking about codifying something that still got to run its course through the court system a little bit? Um, or can we live with the policy? Is the state okay with just keeping the policy? Or is there a timeline where the state would like us to have it codified? You know, we the city hasn't been approached by the state or anybody regarding our policy or how we're handling SB9 or challenging what that it's not consistent with the state law. Um, in terms of a lawsuit, my understanding is there is a lawsuit. I don't know if Lana can sort of shed any light on to, as to the status of that. At, at this point, Glendora has not joined that lawsuit, but there is a lawsuit of one or more cities that are are pursuing um, court action. And Lana, maybe you can share the status of that. Yes, there is a at least a couple of lawsuits pending, actually, involving several cities uh, with respect to general challenges to SB9 and um, in including some of the issues which uh, Mr. Friedall, for example, raised with respect to how it's even compatible with uh, 
mortgage and and loan agreements uh, and deeds and deeds of trust. Uh, that's definitely pending. That it um, we don't know where that's going to go yet. It has not even reached the briefing stage. It's very early. And while we do have a early iteration of uh, a, a, call it template ordinance uh, for SB9 implementation, it's every few couple of weeks, it seems to develop uh, as we try to sort through, uh, through talking with HCD, through talking with other housing developers, through talking with um, the state, it, it continues to develop. Uh, we do have a form, we could start with that, but it's probably not gonna be what we finally end up with. Okay, that kind of answers my question. I do like the quarterly updates. I think they are very helpful. Um, so I would like to continue them, but I, I would think uh, we might be putting the cart before the horse a little bit on codifying it until it kind of runs its course through some of the, the, the legal processes uh, with some of the jurisdictions and cities in the, in the state. So, but I do like the updates and I'd like to see those continue. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Norwood. Uh, Commissioner Ursetti via Zoom. Yeah, thank you, Chair Davis. <clears throat> um, I agree uh, with Commissioner Norwood that, that uh, we should just wait on the municipal code uh, and kind of agreeing what uh, Lana said that um, it's going to change eventually if, if we put it into law now. So to, to avoid that step and, and see what comes of it. Um, and then if, if we're not under, under any pressure to, to get that thing done now, then, then waiting would be okay. And I'd be okay with a semi-annual update if, uh, if we're getting uh, zero applications. Um, but uh, I'll leave that up to the rest of the commissioners. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Becerra. Thank you. Um, I, I tend to agree we should wait on the uh, doing anything to the municipal code at this time. I would like to stay with the quarterly reports only because I believe that it takes time to do your due diligence, get your financing, put it all together. And it could take six months to a year and then we could see a flood of things happening and we want to be ahead of the curve if something like that does happen we just want to know where it's going so i would like to stay with the quarterly report uh thank you uh vice chair cost uh, i agree i think the the quarterly updates are very helpful i i also agree with uh, what my fellow commissioners have said i think we are at some point going to get applications and so i i think that's important to stay ahead of that um, I also uh, agree that we should wait until, you know, there's, you know, it, it could take years, obviously, for a lawsuit to wind its way through through the court system. But I think at least until we get something more definitive, I think we should wait and just keep it a, a policy framework right now. If that's working for us, I don't think we should change it. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, let me ask this. What's, what's different about our policy framework right now that's different from other cities that they're calling us? And how, and how different is it from what the state is asking? Well, there's a, there's a number of things, and there's a lot of different cities out there in California doing different things. But from what I've heard and what some of the conversations I've had are, you know, cities are doing different things. I was talking to, um, for example, Pomona basically zoned their entire city multifamily. So uh, SB9 only works in um, through an overlay zone, by the way. Um, in single family districts. But by doing so, they've allowed four units by right and potentially more um, through discretionary review everywhere in their city. So that's, you know, that's something that's quite different. Other cities are taking a more obstructionist approach uh, through, you know, expanding their, his, like uh, uh, expanding historic overlay districts, uh, Pasadena's case to prevent SB9 in a lot of areas, um, you know, in lawsuits. SB, in, the, in lawsuits, <laughs> right? Yeah, and they get sued. Um, and then there's, uh, yeah, lawsuits, uh, pending lawsuits. And then I think one thing that's a little different with ours, I guess two aspects is 
we treat the secondary units basically the same as ADUs. Um, and that is compliant with state law because it sort of says, hey, it has this floor of 800 square feet and then we allow up to 1,000 if you're not exceeding your floor to area ratio. You know, if you um, don't have a certain you know, excessive number of detached structures, that sort of thing. And so that is sort of a simplified approach to it. Uh, so that's one thing. And then second, and probably the most significant difference with some of the neighboring cities is the allowing of one basically full-size primary residence on a lot if it's split. And kind of when we were discussing this last year, um, you know, our thinking was, if you have full-size house, full-size house, two tiny homes, full-size house, two tiny homes, that's not, doesn't feel to me like that's compatible, I think to us, like it's compatible with sort of the existing neighborhood conditions. So in this case, you would have basically full-size houses on a street. One would have to be a little smaller on the SB9 lot, the new lot, to allow for that potential secondary ADU, secondary unit um, behind it or on the side of it, um, or, you know, meeting the front step back, it could be in front. So really in those areas, um, some of the other cities and jurisdictions have basically said, hey, if you do this, you can only have 800 to 800 square foot houses. Um, and that's so that by allowing one full size, that's a little different. So I think those are really the substantial differences uh, with our policy framework with some of the, you know, more obstructionist, some of the more creative things out there. And, and of course, some of the legal challenges. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you, Hans. Um, I would concur with my fellow commissioners that I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of the more frequent updates as opposed to less of them. However, if there's nothing to report, then I don't think we really need to have one. I think as it's triggered, if you get an application, then like maybe we should know about it. If you get two of them, we should know about it. If we don't get one for the next six months, I don't think you need to come up here and go, we don't have anything, <laughs> just my opinion. Just commenting on that, but I do like the the reason I would still like to see the quarterly updates. I like to hear the conversations you have with the people that are even inquiring about it. The information, pertinent information. Yeah, yeah that yeah. that, that kind of might lead to something or even some of the informative discussions you've had with other agencies on. So it's, I think it, uh, so I'm of the opinion that I'd like to, even if there's no applications, I would still like the updates just because uh, I do I, like, I, I like those to hear what you talk about with the potential applicants in other jurisdictions and things like that. Also, that'll give us an update on the lawsuits too. Yep. That are stemming from this. Yep. Okay, very good. Uh, Hans, thank you very much. Thank see you. See you next quarter. <laughs> or, or do we see you later on tonight? <laughs> Okay, so now we're into uh, public hearings. Um, we're here to uh, for a consideration of a resolution of the Planning Commission approving a certificate of appropriateness to allow construction of a detached two-car garage at 200 South Vista Bonita Avenue, a designated historic landmark site within the historic preservation overlay zone, project number PLN 22-0014. I now declare this uh, public hearing open. I invite senior planner Hans Friedel to present the staff report. <laughs> Welcome back, haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> well, Chair Commissioners, thank you. So that was a fast quarter there that went by. Um, so um, the applicant is requesting again a C, a C of A um, to allow exterior modifications to their historic landmark site, um, also within the historic overlay zone to construct a new detached two-car garage. Um, and adopt the CEQA categorical exemption for small structures, um, you know, such as garages. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, subject site is 200 South Vista Bonita Avenue. Um, it's a, it's the, you kind of see it in the center there and outlined with the yellow rectangle. Uh, it's a single family residence and carriage house on a corner lot at the Southeast corner of Vista Bonita and Carroll Avenue. Uh, it's actually right down the street from us. This is Vista Bonita behind us. So you can almost see it if you step outside. Um, importantly, there's an alley running behind the house as well on the east side. So we'll see more of that later when we see the garage location. Um, yeah, and uh, go ahead and the next slide, please. 
Okay, so in terms of uh, just sort of zoning, um, the house is within an R3 multifamily zoning district and historic preservation overlay zone, the HPOZ, uh, in the red area there, again in the center. Uh, the sort of pink colored or lavender zoning, that's the civic center area plan and village core uh, zoning. And we are just in the sort of um, immediately northwest of this uh, subject property in that sort of central pink rectangles where the city hall is. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the existing house and carriage house are designated historic landmarks and within the HPOZ again, so they're, they're themselves a historic landmark and they're within the historic preservation overlay zone. Um, the subject property is also uh, subject to a Mills Act agreement. And again, just for the benefit of those who may be unfamiliar with that, the Mills Act is a California state law that allows um, cities to enter into contracts or agencies, local agencies with home, uh, homeowners of historic structures, uh, providing tax abatement uh, to preserve and maintain the structure and do you know, relevant updates that enhance its character, um, historic character. Uh, the house was built in 1909. And interestingly, it was also the residence of Glendora's first mayor, uh, J.S. Brubaker, who is behind me on the wall and the honorable, honorable Brubaker on the first picture over here. So interesting piece of history. Uh, next slide, please. And here's the house as it appears today. Um, it's representative of Victorian Queen Anne style architecture. Uh, you've got a large wraparound porch, uh, sort of asymmetric front facade, steep roof pitches. Dormers, prominent trim, um, and lots of other interesting features. And the carriage house, you can kind of just see behind it to the left there, sort of directly behind that tree. Um, again, showing it's on a corner lot. And the corner lot's about it's roughly a third of an acre in size. And this is looking um, southeast. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here's, sort of, uh, here's the carriage house in the alley. So that's the alley sort of running kind of two-point perspective, sidewalk going right and alley going to the left. Um, sort of the backstory here is originally the applicant, um, it approached the city and was interested in adding a garage door to the historic carriage house structure. Um, staff recommended, however, exploring, leaving that as is and um, taking advantage of our, our code to construct a new detached garage that's compatible with the existing historic structures. Um, technically, the house is legal non-conforming as Glendora, Glendora Municipal Code does require two car garages for single family homes, uh, you know, exempting ADUs, uh, JADUs. So this will bring it um, more into conformance if with the garage. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the site plan um, showing the location of the proposed detached garage in the yellow square at the uh, kind of bottom right corner. Uh, southeast corner of the property opening onto the alley. So the cars will back, enter an egress onto that alley. Um, garage is just a little over 400 square feet. Uh, it's like 428 uh, to dominate two 10 by 20 parking spaces, uh, compliant parking spaces. Next slide, please. And here are some elevations for the proposed garage. Um, the Secretary of the Interior has guidelines for the treatment of historic properties, which include guidelines for new additions. Um, the basic idea is that new additions are subordinate to the historic structure, like not blocking views, not overshadowing it, etc., and are also architecturally compatible, yet distinguishable from the main building. Um, our code also requires detached garages to be architecturally compatible with the main house. So. Um, that's sort of the things driving the architecture of this garage design. Um, the second detached structure is opposed to the carriage house as an overhead garage door. Um, I know Tuesday night is trivia night for a lot of folks. So a fun fact I, I looked up was the first overhead garage door was invented in 1921 and this house dates to 1909. So the fact that it does have a overhead garage door dates us about a decade after the original house. Um, so people won't mistake this for a 1909 house or addition. Uh, next slide, please. I think we have some, these are, okay, so these are some uh, renderings, uh, photo simulations, if you will, created by the applicant who's here tonight. Um, and so that is the carriage house on the left. And just, you can just see the, the sort of dormer form of the roof of the new garage to its right there. Um, and that's, you know, kind of the alley back there. Uh, next slide, please. 
And here's a sort of view back in the alley. If you were in the alley looking directly towards City Hall, actually, um, northwest of how the garage with its new door will appear um, sort of backing onto the alley as it relates to the uh, uh, carriage house, which has a hayloft. So it's a quite a bit taller structure. This new structure is what, 16 feet in height, which our code limits uh, detached structures to be no taller than that. Uh, next slide, please. And again, another view, sort of looking down the alley, again, sort of southwestish um, of the garage. And you can kind of see that it's recessed back um, from the uh, carriage house along the alley line again, so as to not sort of be super visually prominent. Uh, next slide, please. So um, staff recommends uh, finally here that the Planning Commission adopt a categorical exemption pursuant to section 15303 of CEQA um, and adopt a resolution approving the certificate of appropriateness. Um, I do have the applicant, um, Alan Brookman, who is the homeowner and also an architect um, here tonight, if you'd like to say a few words. Um, and with that, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hans. Okay, I would like to invite the uh, applicant, uh, Alan Brookman, to address the commission. Uh, Mr. Brookman, you have uh, 10 minutes. I don't need that much. <laughs> I mean, Hans, Hans did a great job. Um, yep, the only thing I wanted to add was my, my original um, idea with the, uh, with the carriage house was to put the, the, uh, the, the second garage door on the uh, south side where it wouldn't be visible right away from just about anywhere. But, uh, you know, I did that with a certain amount of trepidation, and you know, I... I uh, you know, I really appreciate being able to live in in uh, the Brubaker house. It's a, it's a wonderful, comfortable house, and uh, I think it's a gem in the city. And I want to, you know, I want to take care of it. Um, just added a new roof on it, and uh, so uh, the wife wants a place to park the car inside. So um, hence, uh, hence this uh, project. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, okay, uh, Commissioner Becerra. I love the house. Uh, it is a gym. Every time I drive by it, I love it. Um, and I have seen the work being done on it. Uh, I think it's a good idea. And your wife should be able to park her car in a garage. So yeah, <laughs> that's what I have to say. Vice Chair Koss. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful house. I appreciate you buying it and, and, and taking care of it. And, and I think the garage will be a great addition to the property. Commissioner Norwood. Yeah, I concur with uh, my fellow commissioners. I, I, I do enjoy driving by the house and seeing the work you've been doing on it. And I think the garage uh, is well deserved for your wife. So, um, yeah, I'm fine with it. Uh, Commissioner Ursetti via Zoom. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I I agree. I think it's a beautiful home, and I think a garage uh, just well placed, like you have it, uh, is would be great. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I have one question for you. In one of the elevations, let me go to it here. Um, this one here shows the back side, the south side of the carriage house. Yes. This is this is ticky tack, but I, I noticed that the siding is kind of loose and could use a paint job. Is that in the works? Yeah, in fact, that's one of the conditions of approval is that Beautiful. I that I paint Beautiful. everything. So yeah. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good then. Thank you. Anything else? Oh, right. Thank I, you very much. I, thank you much for your time. I will just ask that while the applicant is present, I will just ask the applicant, have you reviewed all of the uh, conditions of approval, and do you accept the conditions of approval as a matter of record? Uh, yes, yes, I have read them, and they, they're all fine. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brookman. Uh, is there anybody else uh, from the public who would like to speak at this time? Anybody via Zoom? Thank you, Chair. At this time, we received no requests via Zoom to give public comment. Uh, no additional emails as well. Okay. All right. No. Okay. So now we've already invited you up here. You've already spoken. Okay. So uh, with that, I'll bring it back to the uh, to the commission um, for any final thoughts on the project, uh, Vice Chair Koss. I have none. I would move to approve it. Uh, I have none. I would move to approve it as well. 
Okay, I'll make a motion. We'll, so I think at this point we can close the public hearing and start with the motions. I now close the public hearing and call for a motion. I'll move. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll reiterate my motion. <laughs> I will second the motion. <laughs> All right, now we got to do the... Uh... Yes, thank you. That was a motion by Commissioner Norwood, a second by uh, uh, Vice Chair Koss uh, to adopt categorical exemption pursuant to Government Code 15303 of the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines and adopt Planning Commission Resolution PC 2022-08 entitled Resolution of the Planning Commission approving a, a certificate of appropriateness to allow construction of a detached two-car garage at 200 South Vista Benita Avenue, a designated historic landmark site within the Historic Preservation Overlay Zone, Project Plan 22-0014. I will now do an oral roll call. Commissioner Norwood? Yes. Commissioner Arcetti? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Becerra? Yes. Vice Chair Koss? Yes. And Chair Davis? Yes. That passes 5-0. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Good luck. Okay. Move to uh, item number four. Modification to an existing conditional use permit allowing liquor sales for on-site consumption and entertainment for live music, both in conjunction with a restaurant, Mi Sabor, on certain property located at 1810 East Route 66, project number PLN 22-0032. I now declare this public hearing open. Okay, uh, Alyssa Palayo Flores will present the staff report. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Davis and members of the commission. Before you tonight is the request for approval of a conditional use permit to allow liquor sales for on-site consumption and entertainment for live music in conjunction with an existing restaurant known as Mi Sabor, located at 1810 East Route 66. Next slide, please. Staff recommends the adoption of a categorical exemption and the adoption of a planning commission resolution approving the proposed project. Next slide. The subject tenant site is situated on the southwest corner of East Route 66 and South Lone Hill Avenue within the existing Route 66 Promenade Shopping Center. There is shared parking throughout the site with ingress and egress from, from East Route 66 and South Lone Hill Avenue. The site is zoned Town Center Lone Hill get, Gateway with a general plan designation of Route 66 specific plan. A CUP is, a, uh, is required to allow liquor sales for on-site consumption and entertainment as secondary uses to an existing restaurant with the subject zone, within the subject zone. Next slide, please. The applicant is requesting a conditional use permit modification that would extend the permits provisions to allow alcohol sales of beer, wine, and liquor for on-site consumption, team it in conjunction, in conjunction within an existing restaurant. As previously stated, pursuant to the Glendora Municipal Code, alcohol sales and entertainment require a CUP within the LHG zone. The existing CUP permits the owner to be a licensed type 41 vendor by the California Department of Alcohol, uh, alcohol and Beverage Control to sell beer and wine for on-site consumption. Modification to the existing CUP would permit the owner to, fi to file an application for a type 47 license, which would permit the sale of beer, wine, and spirits for on-site consumption. Conditions of approval have been included that require alcohol sales and entertainment to, to occur during the designated timeframes. Next slide, please. The subject restaurant will have operating hours from 9 a.m. to midnight with alcohol sales seizing an hour prior to closure pursuant to the Department of Alcohol Beverage Control Standards. Additionally, occasional entertainment for live music may occur within the time, frames, time frame of 9 a.m. to 10 o'clock p.m. Next slide. Here is a picture of the existing bar area. Um, it is facing north within the tenant space. Next slide, please. This picture was, take, was taken facing east toward the entrance of the tenant space. Uh, live music will be allocated along the interior wall. Um, the, this wall here facing um, toward the entrance of the space and that door faces Lone Hill. 
Next slide, please. So here we have the floor plan. The existing restaurant entails a total of 2,530 square feet with 980 square feet of dining area located in the east portion of the space with 62 total seats to accommodate, cost, to accommodate customers. The restaurant has approximately 16 square feet of existing bar area for beer and wine with 20 square feet of storage uh, area located within the designated server area just west of the dining area. A designated area for live music will be allocated east of the server area along an interior wall that separates the server area from the dining area. <laughs> the owner will be required to comply with the Glendora Municipal Code regarding des noise decibel levels. Within the commercial area, as the use may not produce noise that may be considered a nuisance or hazard to any adjacent tenants within the commercial space or adjacent residential properties. As such, a condition of approval has been included that requires all doors of the building remain closed during live music performances. An additional condition of approval has been included stating public address systems shall not be used during performances. Next slide, please. Notices were mailed out to all property owners within a 500 foot radius. Notices were also published in the San Gabriel Valley um, Examiner. Um, prior to the posting of the staff pa uh, staff report to the uh, public website, staff received one inquiry from a surrounding resident. The resident voiced concern with the live music and potential intoxicated customers socializing in the rear of the tenant space. Next slide, please. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt a categorical e exemption and the Planning Commission's re resolution. The applicant and I are available for questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Alyssa. Um, so at this point, I would like to invite Krista Garitano uh, to address the commission. Uh, she is available via Zoom. Via Zoom. Hi, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Um, as mentioned, I'm here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Mr. Antonio Magana, who is requesting the modification for the CUP to allow the extended um, scope for distilled spirits and the occasional um, live entertainment um, on um, periodically to have for like Mother's Day um, or on special occasions. The location has been licensed um, since August of 2020 and has been operating responsibly both within the guidelines of the city and the state. The restaurant itself is called Mi Sabor Mexican Kitchen. It is a family owned business operated by Antonio, Sandy and Sabina Magana. Sabina is the executive chef of the restaurant and mastermind, mastermind behind the entire menu. Her inspiration is drawn from her hometown in Pueblo, Mexico, um, where she grew up loving to cook and learning the traditional um, recipes from her family that were passed down from generation to generation. Today, she's taken all those recipes, put her own spin on it and created the dishes that have um, still the love, you know, that the originals are put in. Um, her goal is to ensure that every bite that people in, are enjoying it and remember it really far after that, you know, they leave the restaurant. You can kind of call it an extension of her own restaurant. Some of their dishes um, include the like caldo de res, birria tacos. Some of their most popular ones are fajita, is a fajita plate and surprisingly their vegan vegetarian option, the jackfruit tacos. Most recently, the restaurant itself was actually featured on a television show, Destination LA in March of 2022. The Magana family themselves have been in the restaurant business for many, many years. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Magana have another location in Upland, California called Pueblito, um, Pueblito um, the Mexican restaurant, which has been operating for over 20 years and also holds an ABC license as well. So they're very well versed in operating responsibly with a liquor license um, and running a successful business. Um, as mentioned, the direct request is to expand the scope um, of the alcohol beverages and to um, have the ability to have periodic entertainment. The restaurant itself is bright and decorative with authentic Mexican artifacts, creating a very welcoming environment for all to enjoy. 
I am here to respectfully request your approval and to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Krista. Um, I, I'll start this off. Uh, I guess I want to ask, did I hear you correct when I said it was for special events only that you would be playing music? So they will have it periodically, like say for Mother's Day, Father's Day, some um, brunches during like summer times. The main, um, the main kind of hours that they would probably be looking at is like between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m., um, but it would be occasional. It wouldn't be like every week. And um, I guess when I mentioned like special occasions, like if they have like a new menu item that they kind of want to draw some attention to. Okay. And I also heard no, no public address. So they can't use a microphone. That is correct. So they won't be using any microphone. There won't be any amplified musics. Um, as mentioned, all doors will remain closed to prevent any, you know, um, noise from traveling. Okay. And a condition of approval was included to, um, not permit any, uh, public address systems. Okay. I, I, I would ask, why that is there are public address music around town here what is what is different about this location that is unique to other locations i, th I think the intent of the is they're wanting this for mariachi music which doesn't need the pa system Good. point taken okay uh with that i'll uh go to my commissioners uh commissioner norwood they were concerned about the rear, but they're, I mean, uh, this is one shopping center I do frequent quite often. Um, there, there is no rear access for public gatherings, seating. There's no parking back there. It's very narrow. And I, you know, I, I could understand the, the residents that are buttoned up against uh, the, just uh, west of the location. So that's part of the conditional use that there would be no seating or uh, public gatherings to the rear of the structure. Correct, yes. And those doors um, are required to um, be closed during any live performances. And yeah, there's, it wouldn't be an accessible location for customers. Okay, okay. Okay, I got the cart before the horse a little bit here. I need to invite any members of the public to address the commission at this point. Do we have anybody via Zoom or do we have anybody that wishes to speak? Uh, thank you, Chair. At this time, we see no raised hands uh, to give public comment at this point and no public comments received via email as well. Okay. Uh, then I will move on to uh, Commissioner Ursetti. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Krista, and thank you, Alyssa. Alyssa, um, I was reading through, and one of the conditions I saw was that the outdoor, the front outdoor seating was to come down as a condition of approval for this. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. But um, that wouldn't prevent the owners from in the future uh, filing an application to resume or um, bring back that outdoor dining. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the only question I have. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Becerra. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question about the outdoor dining. Um, is the outdoor dining permitted through the alfresco program currently, or is that allowed just because the ownership is allowing that? So during the sort of, we'll call it Glendora's version of the alfresco program. I think alfresco, the alfresco program is a city of Los Angeles program, if, that, if I'm correct. I think it's or, like or everywhere the, it's where you see the outdoor dining right but i think that's I th so in glendora what we did when the you know covid pandemic started affecting restaurants in particular because they all had to close and then there were partial openings and then there were ability provided um, to serve outside and so what the city did is we quickly put together some uh, regulations and a permitting process to temporarily use outdoor spaces including parking spaces within parking lots but now that you know those um you know those issues are really ending but pretty much all while well, all restaurants are now serving indoors again you know we have a handful of businesses that we're working with 
um, to try to, you know, get them to remove some of the outdoor, you know, tents that were constructed in parking areas. Um, and this is one of them. So with the um, request for uh, an additional permit for alcohol, we're asking that at this time that they, um, they remove the, the improvements that are uh, currently in parking spaces. Um, I think we're, when it, when it comes to that issue, you know, we're looking at how we might do that in the future. We don't have permanent regulations to do that. Um, I think uh, the issues will be both uh, providing adequate parking and shopping centers and safety. Um, how do you do both of those things? Um, but we haven't refined procedures um, to do that. So um, we're asking that the temporary tents and, and also these tents are not uh, they don't meet the building code as permanent structures. And so they, under the building code, they can only be out there for six months with permits and then would need to be removed. So, so we're having, asking this one to be removed so we can um, look at those issues, but it wouldn't preclude a restaurant from um, possibly doing that in the future once we can adopt some type of procedures. In the, in the meantime, they do have some outdoor dining available. Um, I believe that this restaurant in the past has used some of the, the pa outdoor patio area. Um, for outdoor dining is other restaurants that have that ability when you're up on a raised curb. Um, and in the conditions of approval, uh, one of the conditions does allow um, the service of alcohol um, within an outdoor patio, um, so long as it's approved by both the city as well as um, ABC. Okay, so I guess my question is in the future, uh, if the CDC or uh, health department ever says that we need to open it again, will they be able to serve a full line of alcohol and have entertainment on the patio? Or am I jumping the gun here? Well, the patio, no, because we're saying patio, uh, the, for the entertainment, right, uh, entertainment's right. only inside. Okay. Uh, but for the alcohol use, I guess we're just saying is we crafted it in a way where while the, the temporary outdoor parking lot area is being removed. Okay if they want to pursue in the future doing a permanent outdoor area, like they have a small area, maybe on the side patio there, they can work with the city and the ABC to get that approved. We, they won't have to come back here to the planning commission. It's crafted that the planning commission is okay with this use and this alcohol, but they have to get the outdoor seating areas officially, whatever the patio formal one would be in the outdoor area in the future. Okay, and are we limiting the number of seats that are gonna be on the patio? if that ever occurs, since it's not coming back to us, are we limiting the number of seats on the patio? Not, not currently. Uh, they don't have that big of a patio. The, the, one of the fronts, not very big. They, I don't think they could get very many at all there. That only option I think they might have is really on the side mm -hmm. on this, where there's a, a kind of fountain thing. Well, I think that every Mexican restaurant should serve margarita. So <laughs> I think that's really important. Um, and we need more places to serve um, Bloody Marys on Sunday morning. So that's really important to me. Right. I just want to make sure that the community um, doesn't have a problem with sound because people laughing yeah. can, you know, can create a problem. And um Sometimes when you allow people to go outside, it just, you know, you say, oh, just this area here. And before you know it, it's like right. gross. Right. And alcohol does that to people. Right. <laughs> but um, I think we should probably control that just a little bit. Right. But uh, yeah, it would be, I would support this if right. we could get those conditions tight. Sure. And there's also a condition of approval um, stating that rest, uh, the restaurant is required to provide the menu at so at all times that liquor is, is is sold to ensure that they're not just sitting there and having a drink the entire time they're also consuming it with 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 a meal but I'm sure that's something that we can look into and the hours uh to midnight can i the hours are to midnight every night for the restaurant yes but alcohol sales um sees an hour prior to that so until 11 p.m but keep in mind, the CEP is only regulating the alcohol use. Correct. Okay. And the entertainment hours. If they want to close earlier or over for the restaurant, that's yeah. we don't we don't get in that business. It's oh, a, right. We're doing the entertainment and use only Got regulations. Okay. 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 Just for clarification, you're not asking for an additional condition of approval with your comments, are you? I'm not. Okay. Just want to make sure. You said tighten up the conditions, and I said okay. I mean, well, they're talking that. about a very small patio then we can't really put many seats out there and we're not doing an extended tent. 
in the future. So I don't think I need any additional conditions. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Koss. Well, I, I agree about, you know, you have to have the mimosas on Sunday morning. So um, I think that, that that's a good thing. Um, I also, um, so my understanding, just to make sure I'm clear, the, the temporary 10 is going to come down as a condition of approval, correct? Correct. And then later on, if they choose to get outdoor dining, they can simply do that without having to come back to us. That would be included within the, the, the what's being proposed in this, in this condition of approval, I mean, okay. this uh, CUP. One other question. You said you had one resident from the area that had asked questions or had concerns about noise. And I guess it was noise gathering in the back parking lot. Um, were, were they then satisfied after you talked to them or were they still concerned about it? Do you, do you remember? Yeah. So they ultimately um, were concerned and I did reassure them that it would be up to the discretion that this would go to a public hearing and we would have conversation regarding it. And I did further explain that the entertainment is proposed in an, in an occasional manner. This wouldn't be occurring. I think the fear was that you're introducing alcohol, live music, it sounds like a bar. Mm -hmm. um, but I reassured them that this isn't something that would be happening every weekend. It's, it's, it is on an occasional basis. And as Chris has stated, it's for like Cinco de Mayo, Valentine's Day, special events. And once the, um, once the resident heard that, I think he still was a little skeptical, but ultimately was trusted that the city would take care of it. Okay, thank you. That was it for me. Thank you, Vice Chair Koss. Okay, with that, I will uh, close the public hearing. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Let me- I had a couple of questions, but then we jumped into the public hearing, so- Okay, I uh, finished. Commissioner Norwood. I don't know if Commissioner said he's had his two cents or did he or Anyways, uh, my question is, why is this location different than the tents and outdoor dining that take up parking on Glendora Avenue. So on Glendora Avenue, the, the tents have been removed. So there are no more tents out there. Those were uh, required to be removed some months ago. The permanent parklets have been installed um, by the city, you know, as an additional amenity. And each of those restaurants using the parklets has an agreement with the city for their use. Um, the also a difference is that this is being that is being done in the village on public property. It's in public right of way. So the city has, you know, and control over how that property is used. And we've made agreements with those businesses. In this case, this is all occurring 100% on private property. However, the, the the what goes on on the private property still has to meet the building code. And it has to meet, you know, the zoning code. And when you're introducing, you know, tents onto, you know, it, it's a permanent structure. So it's subject to the building code. That tent does not meet the building code as a permanent structure. So the kitty, city can't permit that. Um, likewise, the center, because of the cumulative uses in the property, requires a certain number of parking spaces. Those parking spaces are needed to satisfy that requirement. So we're ceasing the, the current temporary or requiring that current temporary use of those parking spaces to cease. Okay. Um, you know, I haven't, that particular location has gone through, I mean, the 25 years I've gone in and out there, you know, at least a half a dozen, if not 10 different restaurants. So, I mean, I'm, I'm opposed to doing away. There's plenty of parking in that parking area in the Stater Brothers parking area. Uh, I mean, I, you got a bigger issue with the queue line for Starbucks and you do parking, but that's neither here nor there. But um, I'm not in favor of minimizing or reducing the ability of restaurants trying to maintain business in the community and this is one that seems to be doing better than I've seen many of the restaurants in that location like I said in the, in the 20 plus years so I'm not in favor unless the property owner is is adamant about it and I and I do I have trepidation with the, the that the tent is not meeting the building codes but I'm not in favor of as part of the condition, removing the outdoor dining area and the tent. 
maybe I don't have a standing on it because you can't issue the permit. I mean, it's, well, we can't, it's gotta meet the building code as yeah. a permanent structure that tent does not. I mean, that then that's a safety issue. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just go on record saying I'd like to see the outdoor dining continue if they could figure out a way to work with the city to make it a more permittable use. And I think it's something that we can look at as we're going through this. It's, you know, we're, we're looking at the center holistically. Um, and I will just off the top of my head, there are probably five, six restaurants in this shopping center. Um, and so part of the use of the parking, if all of them were using the parking lot, that would be, of course, an issue. So that's really a parking demand issue. The other issues relate to safety um, issues, both, um, you know, people being exposed in the parking lot and then having structures that don't meet uh, the basic building standards. Okay. Because yeah, if they move that onto the sidewalk, I mean, it's minimal. I mean, you still have to have room for people to walk by and go from from north to south or south to north. Um, I don't, I mean, maybe I'm wishful thinking here, but no, I'd, we'd I'd be like happy to, to see something. I, I, I just hate reducing a business's ability to conduct business. Maybe just a clarification. So we're just saying remove the temporary one now. The condition number nine is written vaguely enough. It would, you have to get city approval on it. If for some reason they could find a way to do good parking, maybe that could work in the parking area. But that is mainly the applicant at this point doesn't want it. We're, we'll work with them in the future if they do want to have out, outdoor dining. It would likely be in the patio area or on the sidewalk. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if they can get figure out what that way to, to utilize the parking. But if they if they could figure out a way, it's written vaguely enough to send the city bought off on it, we could. Okay. Um, all right. I'm still not uh, in agreement with it, but I, I may not have a choice on this one. Okay. Fair enough. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Norwood. Um, Commissioner Ursetti. <laughs> Um, no, other than the other questions, I, I, I like it. Um, I think I agree and second everyone's uh, opinion that we should have margaritas with our Mexican food. So um, yeah, uh, I think and a mariachi band sounds great. So I am good with that and the conditions. Okay, thank you. I don't know what everybody has against Modelo, but uh, you know, uh, even on Sunday mornings. Anyway, with that, um, I will close the public hearing and uh, request a motion in a second. Just uh, and just uh, very quickly uh, to, the and applicant, approval. Uh, to the to the applicant, have you reviewed the conditions of approval and do you accept and approve of those conditions? Yes, absolutely. They've been reviewed and accepted and signed. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll, I'll second. second. <laughs> That was simultaneous. Who wants to? <laughs> Thank you. I second. Thank you. That was a motion by Vice Chair Koss, a second by Commissioner Becerra. I will take a roll call. Well, let's see. That is two. Um, adopt a categorical exemption pursuant to Government Code 15301A of the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines. Adopt a Planning Commission Resolution PC. 2022-09 entitled a resolution of the planning commission approving a modification to an existing conditional use permit allowing liquor sales for on-site consumption and entertainment for live music in conjunction with an existing restaurant Mi Sabor in certain property located at 1810 East Route 66 project number PLN 210032. That's a motion by um, Vice Chair Koss, a second by Commissioner Becerra. I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Norwood. Yes. Commissioner Arsetti? Yes. Commissioner Becerra? Yes. Vice Chair Koss? Yes. And Chair Davis? Yes. And that passes 5-0. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good luck with your, uh, with your new license. Okay, um, at this point, we brings us to the consent calendar. Uh, does, wait a minute.
Uh, does anyone which comment on item number five? I don't see. Oh, from the minute. I got it. I got it. Uh, the, <laughs> does anyone wish to comment on item number five? The minutes from April 25th, 2022 special joint city council and planning commission meeting on May 3rd, 2022 planning commission meeting. Recommendation is to affirm the minutes as presented. I'll motion to accept. Thank you. Second. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, that is a motion by Chair Davis, a second by Vice Chair Koss. I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Becerra? Yes. Commissioner Norwood? Yes. Commissioner Ursetti? Yes. Vice Chair Koss? Yes. And Chair Davis? Yes. And that passes 5 0. Thank you. Okay, uh, I don't believe there are any um, commission agenda items. Commissioners? Okay. Um, unfinished business does not appear as there is any unfinished business items tonight. Uh, it, it does appear that there is. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at new business. Okay, so the card is still before the horse here. Um, so on to new business. Uh, we are to... Uh, Review a proposed fiscal year 2022-2023 capital improvement program for consistency with the City of Glendora General Plan, Community Plan 2025. I now invite Associate Planner Natalie Espinosa to report. Hi, Natalie. Hello. Good evening, Chair Davis and members of the Commission. Um, tonight before you is consideration for the Planning Commission to review that the proposed um, City of Glendora 2022 and 2023 Capital Improvement Program is consistent with the City's general plan. Next slide. Uh, staff recommends that the Planning Commission determine that the review of the CIP is not subject to CEQA and to adopt the resolution entitled a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Glendora California finding that the uh, fiscal year 2022-23 capital improvement program is consistent with the city's general plan. Next slide. Uh, state law requires every city in California to maintain a general plan and also uh, requires that a city CIP be reviewed by their planning agency, which in our case is the planning commission. Um, so that, um, as to its conformity with the adopted uh, general plan, and in turn links planning to the annual budget process. In 2007, the city of Glendora completed a comprehensive update to include the nine elements shown above. Next slide. The CIP is a government budget that programs um, public facilities projects and includes uh, expenditures over $5,000 on construction of capital projects such as street rehab rehabilitation, park facilities, water and sewer system improvements, facility upgrades and traffic signal and signage enhancements. CIP projects may include land and right of way acquisition, design, planning and engineering services for capital projects, construction or rehabilitation of public buildings or facilities, um, utility and transportation infrastructure construction, and park construction. Generally, these projects are related to maintenance, improve um, existing facilities so that they increase capacity or enhance the services provided to residents or create a safer environment for vehicles and or pedestrians. Uh, next slide. Based on state requirements, the CIP shall be submitted to the county or city planning agency for review as to conformity with the adopted general plan. The Glendora Planning Commission fulfills the role of planning agency, as I previously stated, um, thereby linking planning to the annual budget process. After uh, the Planning Commission's review of the cons uh, for consistency with the general plan, the CIP will be considered um, with the CIP's or with the city's operating budget for adoption by the city council at a public hearing to be conducted later this month. And uh, that concludes my presentation. If there are any questions regarding this item, staff is available to answer them. All right, very good. So I'll bring it back to the commission. I'll start with uh, uh, Vice Chair Koss. I don't really have any questions right now. Uh, Commissioner Norwood. No, I mean, it's a pretty comprehensive 
Uh, but I've liked to see the cost on them, but uh, I'll wait for the, the study session with council, but no questions. Commissioner Becerra. Thank you for the presentation. I have no questions. Commissioner Ursetti via Zoom. Uh, no questions. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Commissioner. And I have none at this time either. Thank you very much for the presentation. Okay, so with that, I will request a motion and a second. I will move to I will approve, second. or I guess we're approving the review. Yes, that's yeah. Sorry, yes, uh, that is to, um, yes, review the proposed CIP, waive reading, and adopt planning commission resolution, the planning commission of the city of Glendora, California, finding that the that the fiscal year 2022-23 capital improvement program is consistent with the city's general plan. So is okay. there, is That's there what I move. Yes, is there a second? I second via Thank Zoom. You. Okay, that is a motion by Vice Chair Costa, second by Commissioner Ursetti. I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Norwood? Yes. Commissioner Ursetti? Yes. Commissioner Becerra? Yes. Vice Chair Koss? Yes. And Chair Davis? Uh, yes. Thank you, that passes by zero. All right, that brings us to commission or staff closing comments. Does uh, staff have anything for the good of the order? Uh, no additional comments tonight, thank you. Okay, uh, commissioners, anything for the good of the order tonight? I have uh, one. I just wanna say thank you to the staff and also the commissioners for working with me to be on uh, Zoom tonight. I'm at work for 48 hours, so I got somebody to cover for a small amount of time. Couldn't make it back to Glendora in time, but uh, I appreciate it. I was just in New Mexico last week uh, for about 10 days on a wildfire. So we're, we're busy season, uh, but I appreciate it. And I would have rather been there with you guys all in person. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, um... welcome to new. Oh yeah, here. yeah, all right. Welcome. Uh, Welcome and looking forward to presentations here in the near future. We'll try to go easy on you. <laughs> <laughs> and one more time, I just want to uh, recognize the passing of uh, Doug Boyd, uh, dear friend and a uh, well-known face and person around town here. So um, my best to his family. With that, I will close tonight's meeting, June 7th, 2022 at 8, 8 12 p.m. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.